legislative accomplishments. Uh, so back in 2006, we had a House and Senate bill. Uh, and then we uh, actually were offered up as an amendment to the NDAA, which is the defense bill, three times. Um, we never got support from the Pentagon on that, so it went nowhere. Um, today, um, we have a Senate bill. Uh, it's S2093. Uh, uh, you can look it up online. Rubio's the sponsor. Um, there's also a House bill that hasn't been assigned a number yet, but the bill has been introduced. It'll get a number. So we have a House and Senate bill today. Um, and uh, uh, for the last two years, we've had an executive order draft sitting inside the White House and with the Commerce Secretary. So um, these are pretty significant efforts. John and I, I literally, we met with five, hundred people maybe in DC on this issue. Um, and getting it this far is a big deal. Um, so this is where we're at. So the current status is that um, getting sponsors for these, uh, co-sponsors for these bills would be great. So everybody in here could call up their member and say, hey, look, you should support this rare earth cooperative bill. Who wouldn't want to support that, right? And in doing so, um, you'll get more signatures on these bills. These bills are never going to pass. We, we've been in a situation for the last 10 years where no bills have passed the regular way. That means that our government for 10 years has essentially been broken. So the guys that are sponsoring these bills know that they're not going to pass on their own. They're probably not going to get attached to a transportation bill or anything else because that's probably not going to pass either. It's all signaling to the executive branch and telling the executive branch that um, the bipartisan members of the United States House and Senate support this concept. So if you can um, ping your representatives and ask them to help solve a national security issue that's been languishing for almost 40 years, that would be great. Um, so, why are we talking about rare earths? What am I doing up here talking about rare earths? So the executive order in these two bills, they fix a regulatory issue in 1980 that terminated all rare, heavy rare earth production in every IEAE compliant country in the world and the United States, and it terminated our value chain. It's what caused the entire rare earth industry to shift to China. Um, and the problem, this regulation was trying to deal with um, source material. And the source material at hand is thorium. Thorium is always a companion element with heavy rare earths. So in the 1980s, we're all concerned about proliferation. So they changed this regulation and nobody really understands what it does to the rare earth industry because in 1980, the, uh, the um, neodymium iron boron magnet hadn't been invented yet. The single most important rare earth magnet in human history hadn't been invented yet. So nobody even could, could conceive the problems this would cause downstream. So what it does is it allows for those resources to pass through a rare earth cooperative and uh, essentially kickstart a domestic value chain that would be supported by uh, our economic partners and our NATO partners. Um, and uh, so right now, those materials are produced every day by existing mines, and those materials are thrown away every day by existing mines to avoid the source material issue. So the cooperative allows everything to flow through and solves that problem. So you're like, hey, Jim, you're still not telling us what's going on. What does this have to do with thorium? So what happens with that thorium? The thorium would pass through to something we refer to as the thorium bank. It would pass through to something called the a thorium corporation. That's its legal term. And the thorium corporation would be charged with the safe long-term storage of this material, but it would also be charged with the responsibility of developing uses and markets for thorium, including energy. So, um, what this does is it, it, it and, and what's most important about this thing, I don't have my pointer, is that it's a multinational um, uh, uh, platform. So you're bringing in foreign countries, 
sovereign entities, uh, large corporations, and they all essentially start funding this, and you end up with a, there we go. All right. So yeah, this is the single most important thing. It's a multinational development platform. So the way, um, the way this thing would work is on the rare earth side, anybody who needs rare earths would have the opportunity to be a partner in the, in the rare earth cooperative and invest. On the thorium side, um, the Department of Defense and the Commerce Department would have an obligation to take this entity around and raise funds from NATO partners, from large multinational corporations, um, from sovereign funds. So what happens is you get a large funding platform uh, and the interests that have subscribed to it are sovereign entities. And this essentially creates uh, a very strong defensive structure for this entity so that it can't be attacked and be derailed by other people in the energy industry. So, I really should read what I write, and now I'm lost. Um, so why is all this necessary? Why do you want to build a multinational funding platform? Why is something like that necessary? So it's necessary for this reason. China's six months away from a demonstration reactor, okay? China literally has a one-decade head start on everybody, um, and China has a tremendous fiscal commitment to this. So, um, and China doesn't have, here's an important thing here, China doesn't have institutional regulatory barriers, right? So why is that significant? Um, so, New Scale. New Scale wants to build a new reactor and they go through the regular way and they spend six, seven, eight hundred million dollars to permit a design. That's what we call a institutionalized regulatory barrier. So, um, so they don't have those. They can, they're very swift, they're very agile, and they're going to be first to market. So for anybody else with, let's say, the exception of the previous presenter, for a traditional Western reactor program, I would say it's, you know, it's, it's a decade or more out. Uh, the costs are, are going to be in the billions. You're still going to have institutional regulatory barriers uh, that you'll be facing. And the single biggest problem is that if you fund this in a, a, a traditional market sense, you're going to have to meet market risk return levels. And when you take billions of dollars over decades, the kinds of uh, compounded uh, um, returns that are expected by these investors exceed mathematical reality. So, so these, are, these are real problems. Um, so, and, and then the biggest single problem is, in the end of the day, no Western developer is going to build a reactor cheaper than China. And who wants a cheaper reactor? So anyway. So I'm the pessimist in this, 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 this punch bowl, and I always have been. Um, I work very, very closely within the rare earth industry, and I saw what they did in the rare earth industry. Um, and people have to understand that China operates on monopoly scale, vertically and horizontally. Um, and so they're going to do the same thing when it comes to energy. So when you look at their most likely uh, marketing and deployment strategy, uh, and you compare it to what they've done in other areas like rare earths, you come to this really unfortunate reality that um, based on their past history and their hegemonic goals, does anybody know that word? Right? Hegemonic. That's why governments do insane things. They want to control the world and they make people eat their ideology. Hegemony is uh, the insanity that rules our globe. Well, China, God bless them, they have dreams and their dreams include dominance. And in addition to dominance, if you really understand their history, there's going to be a little bit of punishment for something called the opium wars and other things. So, uh, yeah. So if you look at all of this, 
uh, and you look at what they did in rare earths, what you have to anticipate is that China is not going to sell these reactors. They're going to give the reactors away for free. And they're going to give you free fuel. And they're going to say, hey, you Duke Energy, hey, so-and-so, here's your free reactor. And all you have to do is pay us two cents a kilowatt hour or pay us by joule or whatever measurement in perpetuity. And so if that's the case, then I ask you this, who in the real world is going to be able to compete against free reactors that are delivered with no cost and, and fuel based on traditional financing? It's actually impossible. So these, these are the realities that you're dealing with if you're looking at China as your potential competitor in the energy sector. Now, there's a lot of people that are optimists, and there are a lot of people that like to wave the flag or think America is something special and we invented economics, but I'm going to tell you something. What we call free markets today, which, by the way, is not the definition that got us through the first 200 years of our history, what we call free markets today, it's actually impossible for them to deliver because the way free markets are defined, um, actors have no social or national obligations whatsoever. This is a fact, right? And um, so in fact, during the last election cycle, being an economic nationalist was a dirty word. I mean, you put your governments, your own communities, economic interests first, how can you be against globalism? It's a blast, right? That was a bad word. So maximizing profits, right? Including offshoring literally anything that can generate a return. Literally anything. So, and where is that? That's China, currently. Um, so national economic outcomes are not part of the calculus for any of this. Stated more crudely, the deindustrialization of the United States is basically, uh, it, it, there's, there's almost nothing you can do about it. And I can tell you from all of my work in rare earths that China's national industrial and defense policy literally counts on us to keep walking down this dead end road. We keep believing in our system and our system is, is failing us. So John and I, uh, looking at these problems, said, how do we fix that? Well, self-preservation. Um, so what we do is we essentially sell the government a solution to the rare earth problem. And that, pro that solution uh, is, is a solution that is completely insulated. China can do nothing to destroy or undermine the, the value chain uh, uh, for rare earth production in the United States under the proposed uh, legislation. Um, and it, it does that through utilizing resources we're currently throwing away because of a 1980 regulation. By the way, those resources, if you deployed all the resources we're throwing away that are economically recoverable at current prices, we could supply every country in the world and probably most of China's needs, just from what we're throwing away. So we, we use the cooperative because it, in, in the capitalist toolbox, it is the only tool we have for market failure because the next thing in the toolbox is government subsidies and we all know that goes Shitty. So, so what it also does is it creates this multinational platform uh, that, this is a very pregnant sentence, okay? This is the most pregnant sentence you'll read all day. The multinational platform allows for the establishment of competitive permit processing, right? So if you have multiple sovereigns invested into this and you set them up on a competitive permitting uh, um, uh, structure, uh, you're going to get around the existing barriers. You're going to essentially be able to write the regulations relative to this technology. Um, and then the other thing that's super important is China's got a 10 year head start. They have free government money. Um, they have a hegemonic goal and it, it is primary to the economic goal, right? You guys understand that. They're not in it to make money. They're really in it for the hegemony. They're really in it for control. Um, so what this does, once you lock in sovereign partners, is 
you're locking out China. And this is the only defensive mechanism you have for them getting there first. So yeah, this is the old, I'm sure you've seen this slide. This is the stuff we're throwing away. It's got thorium with it. We send it in here. All of these guys own it. The thorium goes over here. And this thing has a, uh, has the, is charged with the responsibility of developing markets, uses and in markets, including energy. That's the platform. Yeah, I'm done, John. That's how that thing actually grows out. And then the, the Thorium Corporation, the Thorium Bank, it has all of these responsibilities that it's supposed to fulfill, uh, but it does it in a way that ties in multiple governments uh, so that you have uh, uh, sovereign coverage and that protects you from the influence of people that are legacy owners of energy today. So that's it, uh, appreciate it, that's the summary. Probably have time for one question or two and then sure. you can bother me, I don't need to eat lunch. Okay, so the, uh, the trade war is going on supposedly right now between the US and China and what effect could um, the gun that you know, rare earth elements represent to our head possibly affect those trade wars? So, uh, John knows this. Uh, the Chinese government never wanted that to become an issue. That was literally their secret thermonuclear device issue that they would pull out during a conflict. It snuck out, they couldn't control it. I was actually contacted by a very, very high profile Washington DC lobby firm representing the Chinese government who actually came to me to ask them how to best manage the situation for their benefit now that it was out of the bag. So, um, look, it, 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 it's a, it, it, I guess it's lucky for us that it came out early because it's going to force, it is forcing some action. I can tell you everything the Pentagon is doing is uh, a waste of time, irrelevant, and misdirection, but at least there's some action. And, and it, it gives John and I better access to the White House. It gets people like Rubio and Tipton active. So it's helping us. So thank God this thing came out before they intended it to come out. Jim, thank you very much.